Stanford University. The need for a knowledge of anatomy of the axilla and breast area is self-evident. Today, Dr. Snell is going to explain to us something of the anatomy of this region for our use in the diagnosis and treatment of diseases of the region. Dr. Snell. I'd first of all like to go through the important surface landmarks. Uh, here we have the point of the shoulder, which is formed by, the curvature is formed by the underlying deltoid muscle, which is projected laterally by the deeper, greater tuberosity of the humerus. As we come up into this region here, we can feel the tip of the acromion process. Then as we run our finger along here, we can feel the whole length of the clavicle. First of all, starting at the acromioclavicular joint and then ending medially at the sternoclavicular joint. In this region here, we can identify very easily the suprasternal notch. And then, of course, we go on to the clavicles on the other side. By running the finger down the midline of the sternum, one can identify a number of important features. First of all, the suprasternal notch, the upper border of the manubrium sterni. Then we come down here to a small ridge or low elevation at the junction of the manubrium with the body of the sternum. Now this is an important surface marking since opposite this we have the articulation of the second costal cartilage with the side of the sternum. As we pass down, we pass down in front of the body of the sternum and then at the lower end there is a depression at the xiphysternal junction. As we pass up into the neck, we can identify the sternocleidomastoid muscles coming down here in this region. They arise from the sternum and the medial third of the clavicle on either side. You note there is a depression here, and this depression is referred to as the supraclavicular fossa. It is bounded posteriorly by the anterior border of the trapezius. If we elevate the elbow and ask the patient to press against the body wall, we can identify very clearly here the anterior axillary fold formed by the rounded lower border of the pectoralis major muscle. And then posteriorly, we can identify a fuller and more rounded elevation, which is the posterior axillary fold formed by the latissimus dorsi tendon winding round the lower border of the teres major. So that this depression or armpit is formed by skin, which is stretching between the anterior axillary fold and the posterior axillary fold. On the lateral side of the armpit, we can palpate the uh, neurovascular bundle formed by the lower part of the axillary artery and the terminal branches of the brachial plexus. Now, one of the obvious features on the anterior surface of the thoracic wall is the nipple and the areola. In the male, the nipple usually lies in the fifth intercostal space, but I must emphasize that the position of this is extremely variable and should not be used as an, uh, as an anatomical landmark. An understanding of anatomy of the breast and axillary area is obviously critically important if one is to treat and diagnose diseases of the breast and axilla. Today we'll spend time talking about the axillary contents, the breast. Dr. Snell is going to introduce this topic uh, with a physical examination. Dr. Snell. Well, now I wonder if we can examine this patient's anterior thoracic wall. I want to emphasize, first of all, the important surface anatomy. Uh, the curvature of the shoulder is produced by the underlying deltoid muscle, which is projected laterally uh, by the deeper placed greater tuberosity of the humerus. Uh, as we pass our finger up here, uh, we come to the tip of the acromion process. And then, as we move medially, we come to the clavicle, which can be felt all the way along beneath the skin. Here is the uh, acromioclavicular joint, and at this end is the sternoclavicular joint. Now, if we ask the patient just to uh, put the chin forward like this, you can see the anterior border of the sternocleidomastoid muscle, 
and if you ask the patient to shrug the shoulders, you can see clearly the an anterior border of the trapezius muscle. So that this depression here is known as the supraclavicular uh, fossa. Now when we come to the midline region here, between the two uh, sternocleidomastoid muscles, we can palpate easily uh, the suprasternal uh, uh, notch, which is the upper margin of the manubrium sterni. And if we run our finger down the front of the manubrium, we come to a ridge here, which signifies the junction between the manubrium and the body of the sternum. This ridge is important since it lies opposite the articulation between the second costal cartilage and the side of the sternum. It enables us very easily to count the various costal cartilages above and or rather below this level. Now as we run the finger down, we come to a depression at the lower end of the body of the sternum at the ziphisternal junction. And then there we come into the uh, ziphoid process. We can palpate this and of course here's the costal margin on either side. Now if we asked the patient to put her hand on her hip and press hard, we can make out the anterior axillary fold. The anterior axillary fold formed by the rounded lower margin of the pectoralis major. And as we raise the arm like this, we can see the posterior axillary fold formed by the latissimus dorsi tendon winding around the lower border of the teres major muscle. So that here is the floor of the axilla and we can palpate in that floor the neurovascular bundle formed by the brachial plexus and the third part of the axillary artery. Now as we come to the front again, we noticed that in a mature female, the mammary gland extends from about the second costal cartilage down to about the sixth costal cartilage and extends from the side of the sternum to the mid-axillary line, that is the midpoint between the anterior axillary fold and the posterior axillary fold. Notice the position of the nipple. This is extremely variable, both from one race to another and from one individual to another in the same race. But if we were to measure the distance of the nipple from the suprasternal notch, we see that the average distance is about 22 centimeters, 22 and 22 on this side here. And the distance between the two nipples is about 22 centimeters. So we have three sides of the triangle, an equilateral triangle. And this is important to know this for reconstructive uh, surgery uh, of the uh, mammary gland. When examining the breast clinically, it is very important that the patient uh, is stripped to the waist and is asked to put her hands above her head so that you can stand away and examine the symmetry of the breast. In cases of carcinoma of the breast, the contraction of the fibrous tissue pulls on the lactiferous ducts and produces asymmetry and retraction of the nipple. Having examined these patients, we shall now ask Dr. Snell to discuss the anatomy of this region uh, with drawings at the blackboard. Dr. Snell. Uh, first, I would like to consider briefly uh, the development of the breast. If we look at the fetus from the front, we put in here the shoulder region, the side of the thorax, and then indicate down here the inguinal region and the legs. We note that it, during development, the ectoderm is thickened along a line which extends from the region of the axilla down to the groin on either side. Now this thickening is referred to as the milk ridge. Now in the human subject, the milk ridge persists in the pectoral region, but in the remainder of the milk ridge disappears. Now if we look at the persistent area on section in the next diagram, we can see uh, what is happening. Here is the skin or ec epidermis, uh, ectoderm rather, of the pectoral region. Here is the thickening forming the milk ridge and the ectodermal cells from the deeper part of this ridge grow down into the underlying mesenchyme in the form of strands of ectodermal tissue. 
there are 15 to 20 of these strands. And to begin with, they are solid strands, which branch as they extend into uh, the mesenchyme. The next stage in development I can show on the next diagram shows a depression in the region of the milk ridge. And the strands are now more complex in their branching, but still we have only 15 uh, to 20 of these main uh, strands. These, each of these strands will ultimately become uh, the lobe of the uh, mature mammary gland. Note the depression of the ectoderm in the region of the nipple. And it is only later, and if I could go to the next diagram, that this becomes an elevation and the strands later become canalized so that we have formed the lactiferous ducts and these become dilated just underneath the nipple to form the lactiferous sinuses. So that in the fully mature uh, gland, we have the region of the nipple with the pigmented area above and below here forming the areola. And inside the nipple, we have the lactiferous ducts and the lactiferous sinuses. And then these ducts branch into the underlying uh, connected tissue. Now at birth, both the male and the female mammary gland are identical. And it is only later at puberty, when under the influence of hormones, that the mammary gland in the female assumes its adult hemispherical shape. We have seen how in the human subject, the mammary gland is developed from a localized area on the milk ridge in the pectoral region. Sometimes one is confronted with a patient where more than one mammary gland develops on each side. This condition is known as polymastia. Often the growth is restricted just to the nipple region, a condition known as polythelia. Occasionally, the uh, mammary gland fails to develop on one side, and you get athelia and amastia. Now let us consider uh, the structure of the mature mammary gland, looking at it from the anterior surface. It is a compound racemose gland, which is confined to the superficial fascia in its greatest extent. The main part of the gland lies in front of the pectoralis major, but the tail region passes up into the axilla uh, deep to uh, the pectoralis major muscle. Now in the center region here, you have your nipple, and surrounding the nipple is a pigmented area known as the areola. Uh, during pregnancy, this areola will increase in size and form a secondary areola around the periphery. Extending out from the nipple into the substance of the breast are the 15 uh, to 20 uh, ducts, each of these ducts forming a lobe of the mammary gland. And as we saw before, the duct is dilated just prior to its exit on the nipple to form the lactiferous sinus. And I'm just indicating the lactiferous sinus in this manner on each of the ducts that I've shown. In the substance of the gland, the duct system branches in this manner. And each of the lobes of the mammary gland are separated from one another by radiating septa of fibrous tissue. Now, if we cut a section through the mammary gland in a parasitical plane, we see the following structure. Here is the curvature of the skin of the gland. This is the region of the nipple. And we can indicate the position of the areola in that way. Radiating out from the nipple, as I've already explained, are the lactiferous ducts. 
radiating into the substance of the breast tissue. Extending down from the dermis into the substance of the mammary gland are strands of fibrous tissue known as the suspensory ligaments. And these are attached to these fibrous septa which lie between uh, each of the lobes. Deep to the mammary gland we have the pectoralis major muscle. And the pectoralis major can be shown in this manner, cut in cross section, and it is attached above uh, to uh, the clavicle, which I'll show in section in this way. It is important uh, to realize that in front of the pectoralis major is a layer of deep fascia known as the pectoral fascia so that you can see that the mammary gland is lying in the subcutaneous tissue superficial to the pectoral layer of fascia. So that there is in fact a potential space uh, behind the mammary gland and in front of the fascia of the pectoralis major. And it is this space that is sometimes used by plastic surgeons in reconstructive surgery. Now just going on uh, with this picture, we can see that uh, deep uh, to the pectoralis major, we have uh, the pectoralis minor muscle uh, cut across. And above, underneath the clavicle, we have the subclavius muscle cut across. And we have the deep fascia here coming down from the clavicle to the pectoralis minor, forming the clavipectoral fascia, which splits to enclose the pectoralis minor. At the lower margin of the pectoralis minor, the fascia descends in the axilla, forming the suspensory ligament of the axilla. So that if we continue the fascia around here, we see how it is held up by the suspensory ligament, going from the lower margin of the pectoralis minor down to the deep fascia of the armpit. Lying posterior uh, to these structures, of course, the ribs, and they're lying in this plane, and running between the ribs are the intercostal muscles. The mammary gland has a profuse blood supply. On the medial side, there are perforating arteries coming through the intercostal spaces from the internal thoracic artery, which is running down the side of the sternum inside the thorax. There are numerous branches coming through in that manner. Coming uh, out from the axilla, from the uh, axillary artery, uh, we have the lateral uh, thoracic artery. And this curls around the lower margin of the pectoralis major and enters the lateral part of the gland. Coming through the substance of the pectoralis major is a small artery, the pectoral artery, a branch of the thoracoacromial artery, a branch of the second part of the axillary artery. So it has a profuse blood supply. Now let us consider the sensory nerve supply of the skin of the mammary gland. Here we put in the axillary tail again and the mammary gland, as seen from the front, with the nipple and the surrounding areola. And then if we put in uh, the nerve supply, we must realize that the mammary gland extends from about the second costal cartilage down to about the sixth costal cartilage. So we shall have the second, third, fourth, and fifth intercostal nerves supplying the skin. And they'll do so by their anterior branches, medial, terminal branches of the anterior branches of the intercostal nerves and the lateral branches of the intercostal nerves uh, supplying the gland in that manner. Now of course one of the most important things that one has to know about the mammary gland is the lymphatic drainage because of the high incidence of cancer of the mammary gland. Let us uh, in a drawing here uh, indicate again 
the, the, the outline of the mammary gland as seen from in front and with the nipple and the areola. And let us indicate the direction of flow of the lymph from the mammary gland. It tends to follow the blood supply uh, to the gland. So the medial half of the gland tends to pass medially, the lymph from the medial half tends to pass medially and penetrate the pectoralis major and pass through the intercostal spaces and drain into lymph nodes lying along the internal thoracic vessels. The lateral half of the mammary gland at, tends to be drained by vessels which run along the lateral thoracic vessels and so pass up into the pectoral group or, or anterior auxiliary nodes which lie just behind the uh, pectorate lower margin of the pectoralis major. So then here we have the lateral half of the gland which is drained into these important anterior auxiliary or pectoral group of nodes. I think it's important to emphasize uh, the fact that the mammary gland is a subcutaneous organ and therefore the lymph not only spreads to these two important regional nodes but of course will spread uh, via lymphatics uh, across the midline to the lymphatic drainage of the opposite mammary gland will spread by uh, lymphatics down into the anterior abdominal wall. Now, if we return to the initial uh, diagram, we can see uh, that the mammary gland is this compound racemose gland lying in the superficial fascia, each lobe separated from its neighbor by these fibrous septa. Now, this is of considerable clinical importance because it means that if a patient has an infection in one lobe, it is very much better to drain an abscess of this lobe with, by means of a radial incision, since it will not open up the various compartments by going across the septum. So a radial incision will be confined to one lobe, whereas a cross incision or a circumferential incision would tend to break down the barriers and allow infection to spread from one lobe to another. Another important point about these septa is that should there be a carcinoma inside the mammary gland, then the contraction of the fibrous tissue will tend to pull on these septa and pull on the ducts and therefore have the effect of pulling the nipple upwards. So if you have a patient who has a recently retracted nipple, one should always uh, consider the possibility, the strong possibility that they have an underlying carcinoma. A nipple that is retracted from birth is usually a congenital anomaly and is due to the failure of development of the nipple region. Uh, the axilla or armpit has the general shape of a truncated pyramid. It has an anterior wall, a posterior wall, a medial wall, and a lateral wall. And to understand this, we can take a cross-section through the axilla. If I show here a section through the upper end of the humerus, we can show the bicipital groove of the humerus, and here is the marrow cavity of the upper end of the humerus. And here I can indicate, say, the fourth rib coming round the side of the thorax. Now, if we put in here the pectoralis major coming off the anterior thoracic wall and being attached to the lateral lip of the bicipital groove, we can see that this forms part of the anterior wall axilla and that deep to it, we can indicate the position of the pectoralis minor in cross-section. The posterior wall is formed by the teres major and winding round it onto its anterior surface is the insertion of the latissimus dorsi tendon. The medial wall is formed by a muscle which is attached to the ribs and is known as the serratus anterior. So just to go over that then, we have the anterior wall 
formed by the pectoralis major and the pectoralis minor muscles, the posterior wall formed by the teres major and the latissimus dorsi muscles at this level, and the medial wall is formed by the serratus anterior on the wall of the thorax. Now lying in this region here, of course, we have the biceps muscle coming down uh, with the small coracobrachialis lying medial to it. Well, now I'd like to uh, build up the, uh, the uh, axilla uh, from the front, starting off uh, with the posterior wall. Now, if we put uh, the scapula on the board to begin with, we show the glenoid cavity of the scapula, and we show here the tip of the coracoid process, and we show the suprascapular notch, and we show here the upper margin of the scapula, uh, the superior angle of the scapula, and then coming down here, the vertebral or medial margin of the scapula, and then here is the lateral margin of the scapula. We can indicate behind here, coming up, is the spine and acromion process of the scapula, in this sort of fashion, indicating it going down behind there. And then if we show here uh, the humerus, we can put in the humerus at this sort of angle. So we have here the head of the humerus, and this is joined by the means of the neck uh, to the rest of the humerus. And here's the upper end of the shaft of the humerus uh, coming down. And if we just uh, rub out the part of the chromium process that is behind there, we put in the upper margin of the humerus there in the head, indicate the position of the anatomical neck, and here we have the greater tuberosity of the humerus, and below and medial to this, we have the lesser tuberosity, and then extending downwards from here, we have the lateral lip of the bicepital groove and the medial lip of the bicepital groove. Well, now we can start uh, putting uh, structures in here. And b before I actually build up the posterior wall the axilla, I'd like to indicate to you the, some important structures in this shoulder joint. We have here the hyaline articular cartilage lining the glenoid cavity. And we can indicate here the hyaline cartilage covering the hemispherical head of the humerus. The cartilage, cartilaginous shallow glenoid cavity there is thickened at its margin by the presence of the glenoid labrum. Lying within the joint and arising from the supraglenoid tubercle here, we have the tendon of the long head of the biceps. And this tendon passes across the upper end here of the head of the humerus and then descends in the bicipital groove to emerge from the joint cavity. This is the tendon of the long head of the biceps. Now we're in a position to put in the synovial membrane. This runs from one articular surface to another, and in the lower part of the joint, it is slack to allow for full abduction. And in the upper part of the joint, one must remember that it leaves the joint as a sheath around the biceps tendon. And we can indicate it in this manner, coming down around the biceps tendon and passing back in that way, being attached to the articular surface in that corner. So that the synovial membrane lines the capsule and is extended around the biceps, long tendon of biceps, as a tubular sheath. And as we shall see in front, it protrudes through the front of the capsule to form a bursa beneath the subscapularis muscle. So let us now put in uh, the capsular ligament. Below, we see that it runs from the region of the surgical neck of the humerus on to the lower part of the glenoid cavity. And above, it runs across here to the great tuberosity of the humerus. So that now we're in a position to rub out and erase the interior of the joint.
and put in the capsule. Sweeping across from the margin of the glenoid cavity, across onto the greater tuberosity of the humerus, and then onto the lesser tuberosity, and then hanging down in that fashion. Now the anterior part of the capsule is thickened in the form of three ligaments known as the glenohumeral ligaments and these extend from the margin of the glenoid uh, cavity across uh, to uh, the humerus in this sort of fashion. Here is the superior glenohumeral ligament, here is the middle glenohumeral ligament and below is the inferior glenohumeral ligament. And between the middle and inferior glenohumeral ligament there is the small aperture through which the synovial membrane protrudes and is continuous with the subscapularis bursa. So this is the subscapularis bursa. Now, uh, laterally, uh, the margin of the capsule is thickened between the greater tuberosity and the lesser tuberosity to form the transverse humeral ligament, which keeps the long head of the biceps tendon in position in the bicepital uh, groove. Well, now I think we should put in the subscapularis muscle. The subscapularis muscle arises from the medial two-thirds of the subscapular fossa, or anterior surface of the scapula, in this sort of manner. And it passes upwards and laterally and is inserted into the lesser tuberosity of the humerus. So it's coming across here and coming down here in that manner. And you can see how the posterior aspect of this muscle uh, is separated from the bone by the subscapularis bursa, which we can now erase. So here's the subscapularis muscle coming across to its insertion into the lesser tuberosity of the humerus. Its function is clearly to immediately rotate the shoulder joint and also adduct the shoulder joint. Now we'll place in the teres major muscle. This arises from the lateral border of the scapula and passes across to be inserted into the medial lip of the bicepital groove. So we can put it coming across in that manner and we can just erase that part of the humerus that lies behind it and put in the muscle fibers, passing from the lateral margin of the scapula across to be inserted there into the medial lip of the bicepital groove. Clearly the action of this muscle is to adduct the shoulder and also uh, immediately rotate the shoulder joint. Now rising on the back is the latissimus dorsi muscle. It arises from the lower six thoracic spines, the dorsal layer of the lumbar fascia, and the iliac crest, and it may take some attachment from the lower ribs, but we see it in the axilla as the tendon coming round the lower margin of the teres major and forming with the teres major the rounded uh, posterior axillary fold. And it's coming in to the floor of the bicipital groove. And here it is coming round like this, and we'll just erase the underlying teres major muscle and indicate this muscle tendon coming round in this fashion. So here's the latissimus dorsi coming round from the back to be inserted into the floor of the bicipital groove. It is here passing pang behind the tendon of the long uh, head of the biceps. It's emerging here, coming into the axilla and wrapping itself round that lower margin. So here we can just place in the lower margin of the teres major as it lies in that position. Well, now we have built up the posterior wall of the axilla, which is formed from above downwards by the subscapularis, the latissimus dorsi lying in front of the teres major, and a small part of the teres major uh, lying in this region below the tendon of latissimus dorsi. So we have, in fact, built up this posterior wall 
here. Now I think we should turn and consider the medial wall of the axilla, that is, the rib cage and the serratus anterior muscle. Now I'm going to just indicate how the rib cage will come down in front of the scapula. So this is going to be the lateral margin of the rib cage. We'll put in here the first rib coming round, having a head, and coming round to the front here, where by means of its first, the first costal cartilage, it articulates with the maneuver in sterno. So now we can rub out that part of the scapula and the subscapularis, which lies posterior to the thoracic cage. This is the subscapularis and uh, the scapula lying behind the thoracic cage. And now we can put in the nubrium sterni with its facet there for the first costal cartilage and then the facet here for the clavicle and we can indicate here the suprasternal notch and then we can come down to the maneuverosternal junction and indicate the lateral margin of the body of the sternum and then just indicate the position of the xiphoid process. And so the second rib will sweep round in this manner articulating with the side of the sternum at the maneuverosternal junction. The third rib will come round below that, and the fourth rib, and so on. And so we're putting in the thoracic cage. And of course now they're becoming oblique in this sort of way. So the costal cartilages are here, and the costal cartilages extend the ribs up to the lateral margin uh, of the sternum in that sort of manner. Now the serratus anterior muscle arises from the lateral surface of the upper eight ribs by a series of digitations. The lower digitations are interdigitating with the external oblique muscle. And we can just indicate the origin of the serratus anterior in this manner. The first digitation is extensive and comes off not only the first rib, but also the second rib. The second digitation will come off the second, and the third will off the third, and so on. And so we have a series of digitation coming off in this manner. From the upper eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight uh, ribs. And cut sweeping around, the muscle arises from the front of the thorax, sweeps around, and is inserted into the vertebral board of the scapula. So we can see that the whole of this surface, then, of the thoracic wall is covered by the serratus anterior. So we now rub out or erase the underlying ribs and costal, intercostal muscles lying in the intercostal spaces. So the muscle is sweeping around posteriorly in this manner. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.